Welcome, everyone. This is the Manufacturing Career Field webcast. And the purpose of this webcast is to really explain what manufacturing is, to demystify some of the myths around manufacturing. And so what I've done is I've brought some alumni into the program that really the intention is just to really hear them, hear their experience, hear their hear about their career, maybe hear a little bit, a little bit of the day-to-day, day-in-a-life and so what we'll do today is one, obviously we'll talk about manufacturing and some of the misconceptions. I do want to get into the cost equation a little bit with you guys and just show you more about the cost equation because I really does help. I really do think it helps to think through, okay, why is manufacturing important? Why is optimized, optimized operations within manufacturing important? So we'll get to that a little bit. Talk specifically is some about the career fields, key attributes and connecting points wrap it up with some sample interest uh, industries. Again, my intention is to get our alumni, so Michael and Brandon, I want them to do most of the talking. So I'm going to try to facilitate and I'll jump in some, but I really want to hear their voice. And And they didn't know each other before the webcast, but we we got to know each other a little bit before we get started. And so, um, so let me first start by just let, letting these guys introduce themselves. So, Michael, you start, and then Brandon, you'll go, and then, uh, yeah, just tell us what you did in the military. Tell us, what, obviously, what conference you came to, and then a little bit about your career up to this point. Well, hey, guys, uh, Michael Warwick, and good to be here. And to see Pete again is always a treat. Um, so, yeah, so I spent about seven years in the Army. Um, started off as an infantry officer, and then went to the Adjutant General Corps afterward. Um, had a fun time, had two deployments, and started having kids, right? So something new in my life that didn't involve deploying all the time. Um, so the August 2017 conference was my conference. I got, I was very fortunate to find a great company called Old Castle Building Envelope. And I spent my first five years with them and talked about a great learning opportunity. Um, got thrown right into a turnaround type plant um, and spent my first um, several months, you know, working shift work, um, trying to learn the basics of the process. Um, had some great opportunities to come by, so came into the, the plant manager role fairly quickly. Um, got to learn the in and outs of trying to manage several different leaders in, in that group. Um, and then not long after that, became a general manager. Um, so in that role, um, I managed a business that covered most of Texas, Oklahoma, and into Louisiana, um, and the sales team with that. So I got the exposure to owning a P&L um, and trying to manage the business and pull different levers that you can in a manufacturing type role. Um, from there, um, the past a little over a year ago, opportunity to come to American Bath Group and that business, as opposed to glass, um, we do the whole, the bathroom, right? So it's the vanities, it's the shower walls, it's shower doors, tubs, um, all that type products. And I got to lead a division now. So I have two companies under me, um, Swan Corporation and Floorstone. So in this role, it's a, it's a national role. So I get to look at, um, the wholesale national sales team, along with the retail, um, and then as well as five different manufacturing facilities across the U.S. Um, and really just that, that brand recognition piece. So how do you manage the marketing and the, a new R&D rollouts um, along with the operational aspect of it? So it's been a, been a hell of a journey, I could say. Um, and I'm pleased to be here. Thank you. Yeah, and, and as we think, thanks, Michael. As we get into your career, career progression, and we'll start to talk a little bit about how you made some of those decisions, same with Brandon, how you guys make some of these decisions and where you go. So Brandon, same thing, introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll go from there. Yeah, absolutely, Pete. So <clears throat> very happy to be here. Um, I was uh, in the army uh, for four years uh, as an armor officer, um, you know, right around the same time as the end of my four years, similar to Michael, you know, I was, I was thinking about, you know, my family and what the next chapter in my life needed to be. Um, you know, very appreciative and thankful for all the experiences that the military offered me. But, you know, I, I was able and, and fortunate enough really to partner with Pete and the rest of the team at Cameron Brooks. Um, and partnering with them allowed me to realize the many opportunities outside of the military to include manufacturing. Um, you know, I was fortunate to, uh, to land a position with Pactive at the time, now Pactive Evergreen. Um, and over the course of my over five-year tenure with them, you know, I, I've got to witness firsthand the transformation of a company going from a private company to a publicly traded company, 
um, seeing a change in CEO and business unit presidents at, at multiple levels of the organization. And then, you know, putting in a good amount of effort to go through some of that change, both personally and professionally. Um, I started as an operations unit manager in our Covington, Georgia facility uh, outside of Atlanta, where I had about 75 employees in my department uh, managing various kinds of shift work, uh, making polystyrene foam uh, products for consumers like Reynolds and Hefty, uh, school lunch trays, plates and bowls. Um, I got to spend a little bit of time on the training and development team. Uh, this was a traveling job that allowed me to go to different plants within our operation in Chicago and Charlotte, North Carolina, helping to standardize our training practices, our hiring and onboarding right before uh, COVID you know, took the, the nation by storm. Um, and then the past uh, almost five years have really been spent as a, as a plant manager. So first in a Chicago location, uh, where uh, I had 275 employees in my facility and we made uh, lids actually for all of the big quick service restaurant businesses out there, Dunkin', Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, Burger King. Um, and then most recently and currently I'm, I'm in our Temple, Texas facility uh, with a 550 employee operation uh, where essentially I have responsibility for the entire South Southwest uh, production of uh, foam consumer products for Hefty and Reynolds, um, as well as the Costco pie containers, rotisserie chicken containers for Walmart and Sam's Club. Uh, so, you know, a lot of exciting things happening uh, in my space and, and very grateful for the opportunity to be here talking about manufacturing today. I love it, man. You, you guys, you guys are just crushing it in your career. You come to the conference seven, 2017, 2018, launch your career, leading a team in a production facility, and both are just zooming up in terms of what you're up to in your career. So really, really fantastic. Thank you for that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit man, about manufacturing, right? The, the broad nature is taking a raw material turning it into a finished product and shipping it out to, to customers. And so before we get into the components, and again, I'm, I'm, I want these guys talking way more than me. So, you know, before you came to the conference and, and maybe you both tackle this before you came to the conference, like, what did you know about manufacturing? What, 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 what were your thoughts on it? And then why did you ultimately choose to launch your career in that type of work? Hey, you know, Pete, that's a, that's a good question. You know, I think at the conference or prior or doing our prep work, you know, manufacturing, I need the, the basic basics, right? You made stuff. Um, I think I knew it was a, a team type environment, so that yeah. that might fit. Um, I knew it was high paced, which uh, kind of fit my personality there. Um, that's about all I knew. Um, I know going through the interviews, what struck me the most on the manufacturing side is people interviewing me, I thought, I was more similar to them in personality or the fit seemed to be better. Okay. So without really knowing what I was getting into, uh, I think that was probably the, the most striking aspect of why I played shows manufacturing at the end. And this isn't a manufacturing comment, but you know, countless people that I talked through or have talked to through the years, I mean, that's really it, right? It, it's not necessarily, Hey, I knew I wanted manufacturing. It's like, Hey, I fit with this company. I fit with these people. I fit with this culture. I fit with, fit with this career progression. And it happened to be, you know, the functional nature of the work is manufacturing, but you're both like leading multiple, op you know, big operations now. And so where you started is not from a functional nature perspective of the work isn't necessarily where you'll end. What about you, Brandon? Weigh in on that. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to echo Michael's comments, I, I, I didn't know a lot about manufacturing. I, I knew what I liked and I liked leading people. Mm -hmm. I liked uh, building teams and, you know, I, I liked getting on the ground floor and, and spending day in, day out learning the operation. And okay. that's the opportunity that manufacturing was able to provide me. And, and I think as I went through the conference, and the interviews, you know, I, I still really didn't have a big idea of, of all that manufacturer can afford. But I know as I as I talked to the interviewers and I connected with them, you know, I quickly learned that, uh, you know, I wanted to be on a team of, of winners and, and a team that, you know, liked winning, liked succeeding, liked interacting with people. And that's the opportunity that, you know, manufacturing gave me. And it, and it emulates what I want, like doing in the military, which was leading teams, working with them day in, day out. Yeah, let's get into that. So keep, keep going with that, if you would, Brandon. So four key components or connecting points. The first is leading a team. And what you that last comment you made, I really hear that a lot 
from people in terms of what they're looking for. Hey, favorite job in the military, you know, what was a platoon leader, division officer, flight commander, department head, company commander, right? Really jobs where hands-on with people and really leading them to reach goals. Tell me more about kind of how you started and specific, specifically spill, speak to building that team. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a lot of people want to know what the secret sauce is to manufacturing or what it takes. And it, it's really not complicated. I, you know, I just, I tell people, you know, especially as I have the opportunity to to work with folks coming from Cameron Brooks that still come to Pact of Evergreen, it's, you know, just get to know your people. You know, you get to know them, you talk to them, you know them on a personal level um, and they're going to run through a wall for you. Um, that, that's all people want at the end of the day is, <clears throat> is they want to build relationships. They want to be led. They want to grow and be motivated just like anyone would, just like we would. Um, right. And so taking those opportunities and, and seeing it firsthand, you know, helping train supervisors, team leaders, being trained myself coming out of the military, you know, and not ever having worked in a civilian environment before that, you know, this is what the atmosphere and the environment is like. It, it was a huge learning opportunity for me, but it also, you know, it was, it was really simple at the end of the day. It's just, you know, treating people the way they want to be treated and, and they'll, you know, they know how to do the job. Yeah. You're not expected to know how to do the job. Okay. Michael, how about you? Would you weigh in on that team, build your team component as well when you went to Old Castle? You know, I, I'd love to. I think actually, this first component, building your team, is I think the most critical one and the one that's I probably place more importance on in, in both of my roles now or companies. Um, you know, Old Castle, when I joined, it was a, a turnaround type plant. So there wasn't a good leadership structure already in place. Okay. Well, it was building a team to take it to the next level. And same coming here to ABG, it's been a very similar thing as well. And the biggest thing I found is getting the people right is everything. Um, people are very talented. Um, so finding a broad talent group is important, but finding people who fit your team and your culture is everything. And you need to be super deliberate on who's on your team, and who stays on your team. And that part in the military, they're going to give you people and you're, you're going to work with it. Um, and you're going to make concessions and whatnot to hopefully get them, you know, in the culture you want in manufacturing, people have a choice, but so do you. And that's a, a component that you need to be very strict on. But the biggest thing I've found, too, is people like to be on a winning team. They want momentum. And if you want to drive a business, if you have people who are hungry for it, especially your leaders under you, um, that's the, that's the one of the winning sauces right there is build the momentum, give them that gold to, to, to go forward, and people who are hungry. And you can do anything with, with that piece. And in manufacturing, it's, it, it can be a grind some days. So having that team that's willing to put the work in is everything. You know, one of the things you've both said, and we didn't we didn't script this out before we got started, obviously, is I want to win. I want to be on a winning team. I want to hit goals. And that's one of the things that it's another component we'll get to. Let's talk. Let's let's kind of maybe we'll go back and forth on these, Brandon. Talk about this, you know, this idea of run your run your operation. Right. There's a product. There's an output. You know, we got to make the best product out there kind of working on the quality and make sure that it's right. Just talk about the idea, not only of leading a team, because I think that that's something that people don't really understand as much as like, okay, what does that look like to run the operation? Maybe, and you could speak on a couple different levels, right? Speak to maybe when you first started versus what it looks like today. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, to, to tie it into, to a book that uh, I'm sure many of us on the listening to this have read the goal, you know, but you right. got to understand what is the, what is the goal of your operation at the end of the day, you know, the goal is to make money. And, you know, that can mean a lot of different ways, uh, depending on which side of manufacturing you're on. But, you know, when I joined Pactive at that point in time, my goal was, you know, don't sink the ship, right? Just learn, right? <laughs> Just learn what's going on, learn your operation, learn your people, right? There will be a time for you to step up and stand out and report out, you know, that, that, that will come. And, uh, you know, as I transitioned throughout my career and I learned more about what a, what a profit and loss statement is, you know, how to make decisions, pull those levers financially to help, you know, then I was able to help make smarter, more business effective decisions that focused on things like the safety of my employees, the quality of the product that I produce. And, you know, at the end of the day, having a, a happy people, right? Having happy people that are, are, are engaged uh, and that want to drive uh, results in the business. Sounds good. 
And then Michael, let's just kind of go back and forth for interest of time, get your voice on what about this idea of continuous improvement? Um, you know, I know that that is a big part of, you know, taking cost out of the system, leaning out the process. We hear words like agile, we hear ideas like Six Sigma, automation, um, change. Like, tell me more about just some of the interaction with this idea of continuous process improvement. Yes, this is a this is a neat one for me, right? So when I joined, I had zero idea besides, you know, reading the goal or, or reading some lean books about what it yeah. was. Um, then when you're you're in a plant and you're a production manager or a plant manager and you're new, you're really trying to figure out the process. And, you know, one thing I heard from my founders of our company is you got to love the process, right? That's kind of the first step is really know what's going on, the eaches, the inputs, the outputs, and what you're trying to, trying to work for. I guess on the improvement side, it really hits you um, when you have a P&L, right? And you're seeing the costs and, and the costs you can shave out of that. And what that means to improve a process, how, how do you limit a headcount or, or reduce waste from defects? Um, and, you know, over the time of, of our career so far, you know, we, we tried different formats to do some improvement. Is it, is it a team that comes in? Is it a guy you hire? Is it whatever the case may be? And for us to end up being the best way is it's the culture. Uh, how do you build a culture of continuous improvement? And for me, it's I, we're transparent with our, with our goal on where we're trying to shave costs or why it's a value for our customer and why it's a value for the employee and being easier. And everyone's on board with that. And we will look at it as a team all the time. So like CI, even for my role now, we have a CI leaders and we have plant leaders. Um, I'm very involved in this myself because we have some really aggressive goals on, on these improvements we want to make. And we tell the guy, our team on the floor, our operators, this is what's going to happen when we do this. This is the benefit you're going to have. And when it happens and they win, oh, man, it builds on, on the next one. And it's that continuing that's build great. and culture you build into it. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I can see Brandon shaking your hand. I mean, I feel like we are shaking your head. We could probably go two hours on this because you both <laughs> can speak to it. But we're going we're gonna to keep rolling just for the interest in that. And you're saying things that I know we're going to speak to in other slides. So we're going to get to that as well. What about this idea? This is what I hear a lot, Brandon. I hear like, I want to get into something where it's measurable, where it's tangible. And tell me more about the kind of that idea of kind of measurable and tangible in terms of making a product, making sure that um, you're making enough of the product. Just give me a sense about like your eyes on making a physical product and making enough of it or meeting the goals, whatever it might be. Yeah, I mean, there's there are so many ways to measure success in manufacturing. I mean, okay. you you struggle to pick just one way. Um, you know, you have your finance key performance indicators, you have productivity, you have your safety quality uh, data that you can measure. Um, and you know, as a leader of a facility or a shift or a team, you know, the true measure of leadership in this case is how well can you communicate those goals to your team and get them aligned to achieve the business results that you need. Um, cause again, as I mentioned things, you know, earlier, like winning on the team, right. Getting the team inspired and motivated to achieve these goals. They got to know what they're working toward. And you have that opportunity in manufacturing to communicate this out. And then, you know, to, to kind of bounce on the, the CI portion of it, there are so many tools out there, power BI, mini tab, Tableau, where you can measure, create charts, report out to people and see how you're doing. So you're constantly in a state of, of improvement. I think some people really like the idea and maybe putting those two bottom bullets together. I think people, some people who are, you know, do some of that in the military, but not to what you just rattled off Tableau, Power BI, all these, like, you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like we don't do as much of that in the military, but I think they want tools. They want, they want to like put resources to the delivery of an output. And it kind of comes back to the goal. You both mentioned the book, the goal, but you know, when a company, wants to you know improve processes they're going to put their money and their mouth behind things that allow them to be successful in the military the mission is readiness right the mission is combat and operations but in manufacturing or specifically in a company who makes a product and then sells that product putting resources specifically designed to ensure that uh that the product is made made well to, to standard numerically delivering on those um 
uh, those goals as well. So that's good. That's good. Anything else to add to that? What's missing? Is anything missing from this slide generally? I mean, I know there's a lot to add in terms of like little this and that, but anything major that we're missing from this slide, you guys? No, not, not from my standpoint. Okay. Yeah. So those are the, you know, if you're, as you're thinking about your next career, for those that are watching this, you know, those are kind of some of the big components, build your team, run your operation, make things better and to, you know, hit your goals and make a specific and tangible product. Okay. The next slide is one that we've started to talk a little bit about th these common misconceptions. And I think one of the, the biggest misconception about manufacturing is, you know, this idea of, you know, pouring a, 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 pot of molten steel from a big <laughs> one to a small one and all these sparks flying. I mean, I don't know if everyone thinks about that, but I think man, people think, oh, manufacturing, I'm in a plant, it's dirty, it's industrial. And, I, and I'd like to hear both of you, maybe, maybe we'll, you know, you can both weigh in on these misconceptions, but Michael, what, what's your experience with this? You know, it's funny, right? So when I first got my offer at Old Castle, actually, even before I went to interview, you know, when you think about a tempering furnace that heats up glass, you know, my, my first thought was this giant fire, right? You know, throwing stuff in there and not the case, right? It's most manufacturing plants these days are, they're very streamlined. It's very automated. Um, that's what I've experienced so far. Now we'll say on, on the dirty side of it, um, if you're a plant leader, how dirty your plant is, is up to you. Um, and you have a huge say in staying, keeping clean and, and, and keeping your plant presentable and give it a good place to work for you, for your employees. Okay. Um, so like, I don't know, I think, it also depends too, like um, in ABG wide, we have several plants that do the same thing uh, outside of my group. I mean, it's a fiberglass reinforced product and you can go to one plant in Savannah, Georgia. That is, I think, probably the dirtiest plant we have. And you can go to to Montreal um, or to Quebec City and it's the most, probably the most state-of-the-art plant, the same okay. product. Yeah. And it, it depends on the plant leadership and what kind of plant leader you are. Brandon, what about you? What about this idea of this industrial, you know, rust belt type of scenario? Yeah, you know, I, I like what Michael said. It is up to you as the leader. You know, I'm a big proponent of, you know, the, the plan I manage in Temple. It's It was built in 1976. Doesn't have to look like it was built in 1976, <laughs> right? You know, how are we standardizing and updating our facility, you sure. know, to uh, attract the top talent, right? To, to make it a place where people feel proud to work, you know? Right. Um, and give a sense of ownership, you know, that that's all up to us. And that's our responsibility as managers of the facility. Um, you know, what I'll tell you specifically from a pact of evergreen standpoint is, is we make products that really, they have to do their job, but they have to do their job coming in contact with food, with beverages, right. things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a very high standard we place on ourselves from a quality standpoint, from a food safety standpoint, from mock recalls to customer inspections, to uh, third party audit inspections, um, you know, we, we maintain a very high standard uh, to the point where we were even going through unannounced audits where we have 30 minutes where an inspector could show up on our floor and we have to present uh, the manufacturing floor to them. And so we maintain an audit ready culture all the time to dispel some of these misconceptions of, of an industrial you know, dirty right. space. Yeah. What about what about the idea? I think some people are thinking, oh, manu manufacturing is going offshore. Manufacturing is going away. I don't know about that, you guys. That's not that's not <laughs> what I see. I mean, I know that there, you know, it depends on what you listen, who you listen to and what you're looking at. But, you know, I think the United States and our GDP and what we're making, I'm not so sure about that. What's your what's your experience here? I think there, there are some products um, that you buy overseas. Um, it, it, it makes sense from a, a profit standpoint. Sure. I'll tell you, man, the companies that I'm involved with right now, our competitors, our partners, we're investing heavily right now in, in a growth, um, even in an economy that's been so-so, you could say right now. Um, a lot of capital is being spent to expand and buy new, buy new facilities and greenfield new facilities. There's a heavy need for American manufactured products, um, and it's not going anywhere, especially on the more custom side or, or the quick-to-ship type items. So I think it's a, that's a huge myth. Okay. How about you, Brandon? Weigh in on that. Yeah, I mean, working in the space I work in, our type of manufacturing can't go away. We're, we're what we call recession proof because we're we're in so many different facets of of day to day life. You know, our, our products. Uh, we we did a study that basically says you know customers in North America will touch our products five billion times a week and not <laughs> even know it. 
Yeah. Um, you can't just pull that out without it being noticed. You can't just get that <laughs> imported in. Um, you know, we, we've continued to expand our business, uh, just in the, in the six years, five to six years that I've been with Pact of Evergreen. Um, and you know, we're continuing to find ways to optimize it. So, so I, I would agree it's not going anywhere. You're, and you're both talking about that. You talk about business expansion, Michael, you said Greenfield projects, you know, building new facilities. So, so that's, that's interesting to, to learn more and understand. Cause again, I just think that people are like, oh, manufacturing, everything's going offshore. And obviously that's not the case. What about this idea? Michael, you said automation earlier and, and, and I'm glad you did, because I mean, I think that's an important component of manufacturing, but you know, this idea, oh, you know, uh, AI machines are going to end up doing the work and re replace our, all of our jobs. What, what's your, again, I'd like to hear from both of you, Michael, what's your take on that? You know, it's, it's a good question to ask because our world is changing, right? Um, I think right now we're exploring, hey, where does it make sense to put automation? Because there are, there are locations where the workforce is, is a bit more difficult. Um, there's, there's places that um, where AI can help you with data and, and going through different items, right? Because like I said, I said before, you get so many inputs, so many reports you get in manufacturing, KPIs, right? And going through the right data for the right picture can be very difficult for a person to analyze. So we're utilizing AI for that and exploring how can we do that better on the customer service side too. Most of the automation makes things safer, more efficient. There's still operators who are there who are working through it. Yeah. You need the operator eye, right? So I don't see it ever going away. Yeah. I do I do think that the, 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 the rough roles and more difficult ones are getting replaced by machinery. And that's probably better on, for everyone anyway. Okay, yeah, Brandon? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll agree. In, in labor constrained markets, automation is an excellent solution. But but I think when it comes down to, you know, GMOs and what 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 companies are looking for us to contribute is we're problem solvers at the end of the day. You know, machines are going to do the work, but you know what? That machine is going to go bump in the night at some point. You're going to need to find the workaround. You know, you're going to need to be prepared for second and third order effects if that things go awry and you run into a service issue with a customer there there is still an an a huge part of just running the business and managing the day-to-day -day operations that you know leaders and managers have a have a very big hand in that's good okay here here's one that i probably one of the things i probably hear the most as we talk about manufacturing you know, it's mundane, it's monotonous, you know, I don't want to do the same thing over and over and over again, every single day. Please weigh in on that, you guys. <laughs> what, what's your experience here? I, I that would was, say, go ahead. Go ahead, Brent. Are you good? <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say if, if it was mundane and monotonous, they probably wouldn't need me <laughs> in my role. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's anything, but every, every day is, is a new challenge. Cause you know, at the end of the day, as I tell my leaders, we're, we're not here to manage the machines. We're here to manage the people, right? That the people are our greatest asset in the facility and, and people are complicated. You know, you <laughs> provide preventative maintenance and lubrication and everything you should do equipment. It should run for the next, you know, 20, 30 years, but you know, people aren't that way. And, and we're always going to have people in our operation. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Michael, go ahead. And I would say that it's, it's dynamic. Um, as a leader in manufacturing, you are never bored. There's always a fight to have. Um, there's always an opportunity out there. It's yeah. exciting every single day. I will say that when it's tough and when it's uh, when you're growing, it can be a grind sometimes. Okay. Especially if, you, if, you're, if your plan is, is immature and you're, you're building a team. Um, that's when you when you make your mark though, it's when the things change, right? And it can be a grind. Um, it's not for everyone, that's for sure. But if you wanna, if you wanna lead people through hard change um, and have a really cool result at the end that, that you're part of, I think it's a, it's a cool place to be. Yeah, I really appreciate that, right? Because that's that's unvarnished, right? I mean, and, and I don't care how many different types of webcasts we do about the different kind of career fields out there. Like, and I, work is work, right? It's not going to be <laughs> simple every single day of the every single day of the week. So that's really good. Okay, you've both mentioned shift work. That's probably the a number one thing I hear. Oh, I don't want to do shift work. Um, what what's the good and bad? What's the what's the plus and minus? Speak to shift work, Brandon. What do you got? Yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing I can think of when talking about shift work is you work half the year. I mean, 
you know, you, you only, when you break out 365 days in a calendar year, you know, if, if in, in my company, if you're on a shift and you put the days you're working at the end of the day, you're, you're physically only in the plant working half the year. So, I mean, okay. that's, that's a benefit. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, as a salaried employee, you know, you're getting paid whether you're there or you're not. Um, you know, you, you have the unique opportunity to really grow and build your team. Um, you know, it, it, it is something that it also we're seeing companies adopt to, uh, less of a, an arduous shift schedule. So a lot of companies are going away from 12 hour shift work and going to eight hour shifts because they're seeing the change in climate from the younger generations that are entering manufacturing and they're saying, Hey, we have to adapt our way of doing things. Not, mm -hmm. not everyone's going to want to come in and do 12 hours anymore. We're going to need to modernize our operation. And we're seeing a lot of that. Okay. Yeah. Michael. You know, a lot to unpack in shift work. I think, um, you know, as a leader, um, on the con side, right. It can be to manage a second shift whether you're on the shift yourself or you're a plant manager over several shifts, off shifts can be challenging sometimes. The workforce can be challenging to find people who want to work those shifts. Um, typically, their supervision is, is less professional. It can be in certain areas. Um, so it can be a challenge. I will say I had an opportunity when I first joined Old Castle to work a second shift. I learned so much, though, because a lot of times you're on your own. Right. Um, and, and, and you're the last person there. And as a way to make your mark, especially if your first role coming out of Cameron Brooks is as a, as a second shift or a third shift leader, opportunity to, to, to handle problems on your own and to show leadership that you can do it. So there's a lot of opportunity in shift work. I will say as a plant manager and a GM, um, you, get, you get calls at all hours of the night anyway, possibly. <laughs> um, so your shift never ends for the most part. Right. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's the thing that I've heard a lot of about ship work as well. Like, you know, the when the plant manager goes home, because you guys, you, you know, you're not at, there at nine o'clock at night. I mean, I guess unless there's an emergency when the plant manager goes home, that's when you really like you just said, Michael, you just get to make your mark. And so and I think the other thing about it, guys, right, is you, you don't work shift work forever. I mean, it can be tough, yep. advantageous, but it, it's not forever. And it really is a boon in some ways. OK, cool. And then let's do let's do career progression because because we've seen your both of your careers uh, getting out in 2017 and 2018 and you're both just crushing it in your careers and so you know we we know where you are because we saw that in the intro but like how did it work for you you know maybe specifically how did you get promoted how did those opportunities come about did they did they find you did you find them you know, just maybe each of you take just a moment or two and just speak a little bit about that. Michael, why don't you go first? Yeah, I think so. Part of it is the opportunities available. I got very lucky in a, on a few uh, parts of my timeline. And second, this is a, is a willingness to take the hard jobs. Um, in Old Castle, I said it was a turnaround plant. Um, so when I came in as a plant manager, after I was there for a little bit, um, we get to make our mark and we did a lot of improvements and it, and it went really well. And my VP saw potential in me to, to do more, um, to learn the sales side, to learn the P&L, um, to go a bit deeper. And he went kind of on a limb for me um, to say, hey, opportunity to be a GM. You're inexperienced. And you don't know anything yet. Um, you want to give it a shot, right? And uh, it was a risk for him. So it kind of hit me pretty personally that he would take a risk on me and, and mentor me through it. Uh, I did my MBA at the same time. Um, so it helped me out on some of the, of the, the details on, on the strategy piece and the accounting side. Yeah. Um, for the ABG side, I, opportunity came in the marketplace and, and it was a referral, you know, you could say, right, where someone had seen me in the marketplace through a GC and referred my name to, um, to the ABG team. And the role was big. Um, and I, I was still a bit junior for that one as well. Um, but reputation helped me quite a bit with that one mm -hmm. um, in terms of what, what we had done in Grand Prairie and Old Castle. Um, so the opportunity was there and I said it was a challenge, um, cause it was, a these two business units I'm running currently are, uh, they're high growth right now. So a lot of capital investment, um, some fast paid growth expectations. Um, but you know, I didn't want to say no yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's been super fulfilling so far. So I would just say, take the hard jobs when they come across, okay. solve the problems you can as hard as you can and, uh, opportunities will come for you. Okay. Yeah. Same thing, Brandon, go for it. 
Yeah. So, you know, for my story, I think it really begins at the conference. You know, I, I, it, it comes back to finding what your fit is, who your fit is culture wise and understanding what they're looking for. And the thing that drew me to Pactive was, you know, I, I knew they had good military leadership in their executive team at the time when I interviewed, I, I knew that, you know, their, their values and their vision aligned with what I was looking for in a company. Um, so, you know, when I came on board and it was just able to be me and do what I enjoyed doing, you know, very quickly, it was noticed. And, and, you know, similar to what Michael said is, is, you know, put your head down and just work your butt off, you know, get to know your people and, and the results will come. And, and, you know, they, the opportunities found me, uh, fortunately. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just try to surround myself with people smarter than me everywhere I go. Um, and, and, and it's worked out so far. So it's been good. Love it. And what I think I hear in that too, you guys, is, you know, you find a company where you culturally fit. And this is for those that are listening, find a company that you culturally fit, go chop wood. That's the language we use around here. Camera <laughs> Brooks, put your head down, work hard. You know, we talk about chopping wood all the time, go chop wood, go, go prove yourself, go make an impact. And for some of you, like that's what you want to do. You want to come prove yourself. And 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 as Brandon just said, good things will come. And obviously, um, you two are 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 shining examples of that. Let's talk a little bit about the cost equation. Brandon said a great. He, had, he you made a great uh, little phrase earlier. You said pull on the lever that will help. And then Michael, you followed that up with with something about kind of managing finance. So let's talk a little bit about the cost equation, you guys. And so. Never forget, this is the goal, right? We talk about the goal, Eli Goldratt's book, revenue minus cost equals profit. And so when you look at this box right here, if this is kind of the manufacturing right here, manufacturing, and you guys are, I want you guys to speak to this, but I feel like these are the levers that Brandon was talking about, but it may not be all of them. So please weigh in on that. But you've got the cost of labor. There's the building costs and things that might go into that. There's a land potentially, unscheduled maintenance, utilities, facilities, raw materials, right? All the things, and this may not be all the things, you guys. What am I What am I missing here? I was trying to think about things, having not walked in your shoes. What other costs are associated with making a product? Am I missing something? Yeah, I mean, I, no, I think you covered most of it. I mean, okay. it, it's it's all in the same bucket, just different terms, you know. Yeah. salaries, wages, you know, sure. uh, workers comp, you know, things like that, that are, you know, those, we, we call them fixed costs and unfixed costs and some, sure. you know, fixed costs, you can't do anything about, like, you're not going to go, you know, change the rent on your building. Right. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about levers that you could pull, you know, you could, you know, uh, get a different vendor that's servicing your maintenance equipment. You know, you could reduce the overtime working in your facility, you know, you could, uh, you know, look at your raw material vendors, which, you know, by the way, raw materials in my business is about 60% of my total cost of, of goods sold or COGS or what we call it. So it's, it's the biggest opportunity for me. Um, you know, in, in, in my neck of the woods in manufacturing, we're making, you know, hundreds of millions of parts of individual parts a day. And I put a lot of money into making those parts right the first time. I pay it in energy. I pay it in labor. I pay it in raw materials. So if I don't make something right the first time, I spend more money to just reclaim the part. So waste, exactly. Um, there, there is a ton of opportunity in reducing waste in facilities. And you even said that too. I don't know if you said waste or scrap, Michael, but I think you said one of those two words that speaks to that as well. Yeah, I would say like, he's, he's spot on. Um, when you're new into manufacturing and you're a new leader, um, learning how, how to control labor and materials for most businesses, those are your, your big cost drivers that you can have, you can control yourself. You can be efficient on your line. Yeah. You can reduce waste. And if you can manage those things and learn them deeply um, early on, it sets you up so nicely down the road. Well, here's the piece about it, you guys. Let's say that this is the cost of goods. This is exactly what it costs to make the product, this little black line right there. And this is how much the, the sales team or the business development team or whatever sales sells the product for. So all of that is the margin of profit. So this is our profit. So the thing that I love about manufacturing and operations in general is 
really good managers have the ability to move this line to the left. Now, Brandon said fixed costs versus non-fixed or, or, or dynamic costs, right? Some things you're not going to be able to control, but the better, the more that you can reduce waste, reduce unscheduled maintenance, get a, get a handle on your labor, the more this line's going to move to the left, the more the profit's going to increase or vice versa, right? We, I know we keep talking about the goal. And if you haven't read the goal, you should, because there was a point in time, it was kind of like Michael's story. It was a turnaround project for, for the character Al Rogo. And was he going to turn it around or not? You know, <laughs> going through marriage problems and everything else. But, you know, the bottom <laughs> line is like having an effect on this line right here is the name of the game in manufacturing. And so it's, I know it's a very simple little drawing here, but I mean, it really says a lot and it's really, really representative of a lot of what we've already been talking about in order to be a good leader within the manufacturing. And so we've ta already hey, talked a little bit about Lean Six Sigma. Go ahead. Yep. You know, I'd add one little tidbit in there about Please. gaining financial literacy early on in your career, leaving, leaving the military is probably one of the best things to set you up down the road. Okay. Um, so for me, learning how to read the P and L very well, income statements, and the balance sheets, I can call someone's bluff when they're incorrect because <laughs> the accountants are, are great people. Um, they don't always see it the same way or interpret numbers the same way or tell you where they bucket numbers sometimes, but you able to, to, to see your costs truly on the off sheets or on the P and L or where, or the spend is going or when they're, when they're going to accrue for it will help you feel more in control. Um, and, and let you manage your business more appropriately. Really helpful. There is a book on our reading list, you guys, called Financial Intelligence. And it, one of the one of the things that I took away from the book is, yeah, there's a lot of ways to tell a story. And uh, <laughs> so being literate in that um, can help you, as Michael just said, not to be overly repetitive here, but really manage the business. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk about little key connecting points. You know, we've talked through some of these the the team leader coach trained mentor let's get into this piece you guys because because we we know getting into manufacturing for a lot of lot of times it's like okay i'm going to manage the team but there's all these other people around right there's all these other people that as a manufacturing team leader you have to interact with as a plant manager you have to probably manage right you're you know there's a lot going on here so can you both just speak to more of the cross-functional nature and interaction of the of the work brandon yeah, you, no. sorry yeah brandon you go yeah yeah absolutely so i mean in in my day-to-day -day, you know i i in some form or fashion have to interact with you know every member of this team and some of them are, are direct reports to me and you know what I, it really comes back to building your team, as we've alluded to many times, you need people you can trust managing these roles. You need to form established connect, uh, established connections, good, solid relationships with these people because, because they can make or break you in your role. You know, if uh, you don't have a good engineering maintenance team, you know, you're not going to realize efficiency improvements on your equipment. Um, if you don't have a good quality team that understands, you know, the vision of what you're trying to do and, and the quality of the project you're trying to put out, you know, you're going to hit roadblocks as you go through and, and you know, being uh, engaged with all these folks, not being subject matter experts in any one of them, but having, you know, a hand in each of them is instrumental as a, as a plant manager or any operations leader in manufacturing. What about, Michael, what about the marketing and the sales? I mean, I, I we represent marketing roles at different companies and part of their job is to come down to the production facility, whether it's new products or you know, maybe, you know, there, there's a certain quantity that needs to be produced to get to this part or that part. Do you, do you, Michael, interact with marketing or the sales piece much? So I do in my current role, I have a sales okay. group and a few marketers and a product development team. Um, you know, it's funny. I've seen two companies now and how we, how, how they go to market. Um, some companies are very functionally based. So your sales and your operations, and your marketing are very separate avenues right they don't cross too often okay if they do it's a very awkward meeting it's weird um <laughs> for us i put a lot of stock into my group with hey we're we're, we're, the, we're the, this division team we're the mold of products team um so our marketing team i mean we i had a, i had the group at our one of our facilities last month we did 200 hours of video right 
And when we do ever do launches on product launches, we're all there. The ops team is there walking through the process with our R&D guy, with the accounting person to make sure that everyone knows what's happening at all times because any miss can be a huge miss going to market the new product. So I would say when you come out, come out of the military and you're your first manufacturing role, learn those things, make connections, learn your maintenance manager, learn your quality, be tight with them because you're really one team. Right. And don't think so much about the functional role you're in because that could change. And when you, when you, when you rise up in the role, like you probably will, um, you'll have that, you'll have that background to talk to them and, and to bring them into the fold, which really makes things spark at that point. Brandon, do you have marketers roll down to the plant and say, Hey, I want to come check this out or, you know, any, any of that going on? Any, maybe any customers ever come to the plant? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've had, you know, customers such as Walmart to McDonald's, Tim Hortons in Canada, you know, they, they love coming to see what we do. And, okay. uh, you know, be a cool thing in operations is you get to show off what you do a little bit and your expertise, because, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of those folks just know how to sell it, right. Or how to, you know, market it. Right. But they don't know how to make, how it's made or, or what goes into it behind the scenes. And so it's really cool to interact with those folks. Um, you know, and, and just, you know, one final note about cross-functional is, just because you're in an operations role today doesn't mean you will be tomorrow if that's where your interests mm -hmm. lie. You know, the, the good news about manufacturing and why it was so appealing to me when I came out of, of Cameron Brooks was that many doors can open for you in manufacturing. Any one of these positions on this list, you have the ability to go into with some experience. Just because you start in as a shift leader or a production manager or plant manager does not mean that you are in this narrow you know, progression flow chart where you can't expand your horizons or career. And that's why it's good to be cross-functional and understand the space other people operate in. And just to give the list, because this is going to be an audio as well as a video, engineering, maintenance, procurement, quality, marketing, and then customer sales. We talked about all of those, but I wanted to lay that list down. We also talked about, well, I'm going to put some of these together and we've talked a little bit about this already, but this idea about problem solver and continuous process improvement. Michael, you said culture. Okay, we lost Michael. <laughs> He'll come back. Um, so Michael mentioned culture and then Brandon, you jumped in on that. So talk to me a little bit about problem solver, continuous process improvement mindset. Like what is, in the day to day, what does that look like? Yeah, so I mean, manufacturing has been around for, you know, forever, right? I mean, at least a hundred years, you know, in America, if not more. Um, and the problems never go away, right? You're either dealing with, you know, new equipment, old equipment, you know, turnover, people, right? That the the problems will not end as long as there is a business. But the good news is, is that, you know, we're there equipped to put our problem solving methods into place to help companies combat with that. And with that comes the mindset of, of CI and what we're armed with. If, you know, we need to understand how to ask those questions, drive down to root cause analysis and solve the problem permanently. And, and that's what, you know, uh, I think makes JMO so appealing to manufacturing companies is because we have that, you know, that can do attitude, you know, we're not satisfied with status quo or the way things have been. Uh, you know, we want to make the operation more streamlined and better, which is exactly uh, what manufacturing looks for. One of the things that, so Michael started as an infantry officer and, and you are an armor, you were an armor officer, Brandon. So what about the idea of the technical aptitude? Michael, you weigh in on this. What kind of infantry officer were you? Remind me, Michael, were you heavy or light? I think you were light. Uh -huh. I was light. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So you walked in like it was probably easier for Brandon, armor officer, <laughs> maintenance, motor pull, breaking, busting track and all that. You walk in light and then kind of detailed to AG. Like, what was that like in terms of getting up to speed with the technical piece of it? So it was hard for me. Um, I'll tell you, I'm not the most mechanically inclined person I can get by. Um, I lean on my team quite a bit um, for a lot of aspects. Actually, uh, Bryce Katsanias, who was another Cameron Brooks sure. um, person who, who came to Old Castle, he's with me now at ABG. Okay. Um, he's the opposite, right? He's super mechanically inclined, very technical. Um, and and he's, a, he's a great partner that I have because he helps me fill that bucket sometimes that I miss. Okay. And I have to work very hard <laughs> on learning the specs for a bathtub, right, or the technical side of it. Uh, right. It's not my forte, 
but a little bit of hard work and uh, some good teammates you can get by. Okay, Brandon, how about you? Because maybe it was easier for you, armor officer, you know, motor pole, yada, yada. Was it easier? Uh, you know, not so much. I was a, you know, I was a history major in college because I intentionally wanted to avoid things like science and math and anything that had to do with crunching numbers. And so then you put, you know, me managing a profit loss sheet on top of that, <laughs> right. and, you know, an engineering field and manufacturing. And it, that's an interesting recipe you got going. But, you know, same thing as Michael is, is you know, just surround yourself with good engineers who know more. But, you know, it really helps if you have that curious mindset, you know, a, a couple of yeah. you know, every day and, and just genuinely wanting to learn. Right. Because, you know, you got to remember, you know, we're coming from the military to civilian life. We, we might know some things, but we definitely don't know a lot of things. And, you know, it, it's good to humble yourself a little bit and, you know, just take a second to learn, you know, because there are people that are coming into the operation that are in the operation you're coming into that have been doing this 20, 30. I have an employee that's going on 46 years that was working wow. in my plant the day, the year it opened. And he's forgotten more than I'll ever know about what he does. <laughs> um, so, you know, it, that, that, that it wasn't easy for me as much, but thankfully I have a good team that pulled me along. That's really good. Um, let's, uh, let's get close. We're going to try to land the plane here. What I'd like to do, and, and maybe each of you can just take a swing at this. We've already talked a little bit about career management, but like bring it to life for us and, and try to think back. And, you know, now we're, we're going six, seven years now for you guys, but try to think back like day in a life. Let's say, let's say the honeymoon's all, you've made the transition, the honeymoon's over now, like going into work every day, like tell me, and I know every day is different. I, I, I understand <laughs> that, but try to give me a, a typical day in a life. Brandon, why don't you start us off? Yeah. So, you know, I, I would make it in before shift change, uh, you know, which generally was around seven o'clock for us. And, and I'd want to interact with, with the night shift employees, you know, ask them how their night was, how they did, you know, maybe just, you know, take a walk around the plant, you know, look, make some casual observations, you know, you can get a pretty good sense of how the facility ran that night, just judging by the, the state around you. Um, and, and really the beginning part of the day is just spent talking to people, you know, getting to know how they're doing, making sure that it's a smooth handoff shift to shift, um, you know, spend a little bit of time strategizing with the management team at some morning meetings that we would have um, looking at, you know, our KPIs for the day, which for us revolve around uh, SQDCPP, safety, quality, delivery, cost, people uh, and productivity. Um and, uh, you know, once we take a look at that, again, it's it's really about tackling various problems that came throughout the day. But, you know, spending a lot of time with your your boots, you know, or in my case, steel toes on the on the plant floor, just uh, watching my operation and, and getting to know my people. It's really good. Michael, I mean, I assume you're going to sound something similar. I've talked to you actually about this before a couple of years back. I remember having the conversation. Tell me more. Tell me. Give us a day in a life when you first started. You know, he said it very well. Um, you know, when you, the day starts, the biggest thing for me was how quick you get your first win of the day. Because how you start the day in manufacturing has a tendency to trickle down to the rest of it. So the goal for us always is to come in, um, fiery, get, get, the, get the team on board, and get that win that first hour of that shift. Um, so the rest of the day is is on track, right? Um, and then – close the day the same way you want, you want to close at a high note so you can do that shift change and the next team has a good start as well and then honestly manufacturing has tendency because it's so dynamic and so busy that you got to have certain set points throughout the day um, that keep you in, keep you engaged with the, the broader business especially as a leader whether it's a team huddle it's a daily meeting to go over kpis or it's a sit down with your accountant to, to go over hey how are we doing so far on cogs this month you know we're halfway through whatever the case may be so i would say Start off strong, end strong, and then have those check-ins throughout the day. Sounds like sounds like an experience, you guys, that you had before you ever showed up. So that's that's super helpful. Okay, let me do this slide real quick, and then we'll land the plane because I want to give people perspective. You know, they it, just to just to give people an idea of the types of industries that we've seen over the years, or really over the last few years. So medical companies like Boston Scientific, Medtronic, Johnson and Johnson. Packaging, Pactive Evergreen, Amcor, Pregis, building materials like Old Castle uh, or American Bath Group, Old Castle, building envelope. And we really, we've seen a different, couple different divisions of Old Castle and Tamco. 
Um, consumer packaged goods like Mars and Conagra, automotive like Altec and Greystone, engineering, tech, Corning, more nanotechnology and ASM International. And so, you know, the, even just the purpose of this slide, you guys, is to is to show you like their experience, Brandon and Michael's experience is two different, completely different industries. They're not doing the same thing, but but they but notice how how much overlap. You know, one would say something and the other would say, that was well said. Yes, that's my experience as well. And so, you know, what we're talking about in terms of leaning in team, improving processes, you know, being a problem solver and growing your career can do it. You can do it in a lot of different areas. And one of the things I love, one of the themes that came out of this presentation is, you know, it's about finding the right company. It's about finding the right people. It's about finding the right culture, chemistry and career progression. And for these guys, they've done that and they're out there doing great things in corporate America. And uh, and if you're interested in the nature of this work, certainly based on what they've said, I think this is an area that you can really explore at the career conference to find uh, find the right best fit for you. Okay, so we're landing the plane here. Gentlemen, I wanna say thank you. Um, I know we were scheduling this for a couple of weeks. So thank you for making taking the time, making the effort. I know you're both very busy. So your insight has been very helpful. I know it'll be helpful in the future as officers are watching this. And um, and I will include some links to, to, to your LinkedIn profile, perhaps. Maybe if anyone has any questions directly, they could reach out to you and you can give them some perspective. All right, gentlemen. Thank, thanks again for your time. Have a great night.